Good morning, Antelope Springs Church. How's everyone doing this morning? Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Thank you. There we go. So before I do call to worship this morning, I just want to do my normal plug that I do every time I'm up here. But first, let me introduce myself. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Jason. I'm one of the elders here at ASC. Um, I do a lot of the, the work with the streaming, uh, so I usually do a plug to if anybody has feel called to do any of the audio, uh, visual, uh, any of the technical things uh, that interest you, uh, get with myself or Derek in the back. He's in the, the booth back there, and uh, yeah, so I always do that plug every time I'm up here. So before we get started, um, you can start. Uh, we're going to read out of Philippians 1.12. If everyone can stand uh, as we do that. But I want to do a little bit something different this morning. I just kind of want everybody, you can follow along in your Bible or you can, um, I'd like to just have everybody take a breath, calm down, close your eyes, and as I read this passage, see where God speaks to you as I read this. So here we go. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has, clear, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the, whole, the word of God more in, cour courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish, selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while, I'm in, while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Eagerly, eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. whether by life or by death, for me to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, again, you joy, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a matter, manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time this morning for us to gather and, and just be together as your children. I just ask that you uh, let us all just uh, calm our minds and hearts and, and receive the message and just let our voices be uh, lifted to you during worship and uh, let it be pleasing to you. Uh, we love you and pray this all in your name. Amen.
trying to feel the same old holes inside. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, there's a pain to take. If you feel lost, there's a way to go. We need freedom or shame. There's a place to shake and take off. You got the shames. He's a chain breaker. Somebody testify, testify. Amen. God is good and all the time. Amen, amen, amen. It's getting out there. Ah, how's everyone doing this morning? It's a beautiful, beautiful morning. I got a, a couple people asking me, because, uh, you know, usually I'm wearing a jacket and a tie and everything. They're going, you're not preaching this morning? I'm going, Actually, I am. I'm just going tropical. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's very exciting. We actually have a baptism that we are going to be doing this morning. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Awesome. So our lovely gentlemen, Vanna Whites, are uh, uh, getting the baptismal ready and prepared for that. Uh, and and I'll, I'd like to take a, a couple minutes and just kind of talk about baptism, uh, just so we're all on the same page. If, if you know stuff about baptism or, or think you know it, but you want a refresher, uh, we'll talk about it. I think, the to me, the best picture of baptism in the Bible is given in Romans chapter 6, uh, right at the beginning, where Paul says, uh, he's talking about 
not living according to our old ways, according to sin. And, and he says, he makes a statement, don't you know, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. And since we are united with him in his resurrection, let us live for him. Amen? And that, to me, is just the, the most wonderful representation of baptism. It is why we immerse, uh, you know, put the person backwards and, and, and bring him back up, because it is that picture of Jesus, of, of being united with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, so that we have new life in him, that we live for him. There's nothing uh, special about the water. It is, it's water. It's two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. That's, um, it's not a, a sin bath where once you sin again, you need another sin bath. Uh, but this is, this is a, a representation, a physical representation of that spiritual reality that we have been united with Christ Jesus in his death and resurrection. And to me, the, the, the other amazing aspect of this is because this is a practice that has been done since the beginning, since Acts and the early church for 2,000 years all around the world, those who believe in Jesus have engaged in this baptismal practice. So not only are we declaring our unity with Jesus, but we are declaring our unity with one another. And I think that is beautiful and amazing. Uh, and so I hope that during this baptism, uh, all of us who believe in Jesus and have been baptized are thinking back to our own baptism and uh, remembering all the wonderful things that Jesus has done in our lives. Amen? Amen. So, Kim, let's come on up. Woo! And any of uh, Kim's family and friends that, that are wanting video and stuff, you feel free to come on to the front, get in people's way, because uh, cause you... Oh, yes, your towel holder as well. Yes, sorry. And I'll... Would you like to go in first? Yeah. You might want to take your flip-flops off first. Oh. Unless you want them to be submerged. I don't like my flip-flops submerged, uh, me personally. Yeah, it should be... We, we tried to put warm water in there. It should be about lukewarm. It's not freezing cold. Yeah, that's nice. Oh, that's good. How you like that? Awesome. Hey, uh, so Kim, you're going to introduce yourself. Um, hi, my name is Kimberly Bimers. I'm new to the, this church. I've lived in Antelope for about five years, so. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you for everybody that's been so welcoming here. It's been really nice, so I appreciate that. Awesome. So, Kim, yeah, yeah, feel free to clap. So, Kim, you uh, have accepted Jesus as your Savior. I have. And it is your intention to live for him uh, with the rest of your life as best as you can. Absolutely. And uh, before this in congregation, you agree that if they see you're not living your life for Jesus, they can come to you in love, in love, um, <laughs> and guide you back toward what Jesus would want for you? I do, yes. Awesome. Then, uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. Man, I could just preach from here. This is nice. No, it's, it's actual water. <laughs> awesome. All right, now I'm going to ask Bill to come up. So he's going he's gonna to give us some announcements. Uh, feel free to congratulate Kim as you see her today. Good morning, everybody. Uh, announcements, uh, are they going to be up? I don't know. I can read them, and they might be up or not. Um, 
The Christmas program meeting is meeting uh, the 26th today at 11.15 here, so immediately after church. Uh, men's breakfast is going to be on the on the 9th of October at 9 a.m., also here. Uh, for those who like cooking, come early. For those who don't like cooking, come early anyway. It's a great time of fellowship, and uh, invite a friend. It's, um, it's an outstanding time to get together and just be with guys and love Jesus and eat breakfast. Um, Christmas program rehearsal is going to be on the 10th of October at 11.15, and the fellowship night is going to be on the 16th. Cliff will have a little more about that, and Andrea will have a more about the Christmas program in a second. And one that's not on here that I added because I'm doing announcements is um, on the 12th of November, mark your calendars, put it in your little interweb calendar thingies, uh, Operation Christmas Child Packing Party is coming, so here on the 12th of November at 6 p.m., we are going to be packing shoe boxes to send around the world. Send around the world. For those of you who haven't seen it before, it's amazing. For those who have, uh, it's still amazing. Um, but if you want to be involved in it and just pack shoe boxes, great. If God leads you to be a part of that beyond that, um, I know we were at Hobby Lobby yesterday, and they have OCC recommendations all over the store. Don't go during lunchtime on a weekend. It's chaotic because everything fall is out. But they have stuff that you can uh, pack. Or if you're like me and not creative, you can uh, donate money or time to just come and pack because I know my garage is full of stuff and will soon be empty for one day when we send those off. Um, so uh, before I let Cliff and Andrea speak, uh, the one last thing I forgot to mention, for those of you who are new here, and the seat back in front of you is a communication card, uh, even if you're not new here. Uh, if you have questions, if you have prayers, um, if you're new here, uh, give us your name and address or phone number. We'll just reach out and say thanks for coming. Uh, or if you got questions like uh, it's now the autumn season, school's in, so if you want to be involved in a Bible study in any way, let us know about that, whether you want to lead one or you want to be involved in one so our elders can get an idea of who may be interested and where they may have an opportunity to lead a Bible study. Um, uh, without further ado, um, um, Cliff, you have an announcement about the fellowship night. Bill's real glad the pool's covered by now. I promised I'd sing to him if he fell into it. Hi, my name is Clifford. I'm one of the elders here at church. Um, I am the oldest elder in the church. They call me Old Man Cliff. Um, about the fellowship, yeah, uh, tickets are on sale now for the fellowship entertainment dinner coming on October 16th here at ASC. Uh, the tickets are $25 per person, $40 for a couple. All the proceeds are going to go to um, Christmas baskets for the needy. Um, and so we're going to try to get in that program going at Christmas time. So all this is going to be good. All the funds and everything will be going right straight to that. Nothing too much else unless we have other ministries that need some money. Uh, it'll be a spaghetti dinner. And uh, it comes with a salad and a roll. Uh, the entertainment will be... Elvis Presley and the Chardonnayers. Now, if you ever wanted to have fun, come to this one because it's fun. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. All right. Well, I'm just going to talk really fast because, yeah, I'll try not to ramble. Um, I am really excited about the Christmas program this year because usually it's kiddish and fun, but this has a focus on parents during the Christmas season with um, that gentle reminder that God's unwavering presence is always with us, even in the rush of the Christmas season. So in light of that, um, I do need a few brave adults who wouldn't mind playing around with the kids and just having some fun on stage for Christmas. So that's why we also have the, the Q&A for after service. So even if you feel like you might be interested or you want to help with something, there's always a place for anyone who wants to help. So yeah, 
feel free to stop on by and ask any questions you want. Yeah, I didn't talk too long, right? <laughs> but as we transition to the time for uh, our offering, it, uh, I was told this morning that um, for those of you who have been here a while, Mark and, um, Mark and Robin, who are living in Montana or Idaho, Idaho, uh, their daughter, uh, I can't read my small writing, Carmen, uh, was living up, is living up in Marysville, but was, has been missing for the past 48 hours. So for those of you who know her and or uh, the Millers, uh, please keep them in your prayers. And as we hear updates, we will uh, let you know. Um, as we transition to offering, um, it's a good time to uh, prepare your offering and our hearts for the, the next stage of worship. Um, we worship in song. We also worship with all that God has given us. So um, bow with me as we uh, pray for our offering. Father, um, thank you for this time to come together. Thank you for this time to uh, sing songs about all you have done for us, all that you are doing for us, and uh, all that uh, is to come. Lord, we uh, look forward to your return. Uh, as time passes, Lord, you use all that we have, all the talents we have, uh, all the funds that we have. They're all yours. Uh, we give back to you freely so that your kingdom would be advanced, so that uh, uh, others would come to know you and your, um, your kingdom would be full of people that uh, walk with you. Uh, Father, we uh, lift up the Millers and, and pray, for, pray for their missing daughter and pray for um, the, uh, the rescuers and searchers to uh, have keen eyes to be able to find her. And we pray for their safety, all of their safety. And uh, we pray for a peace to come over all of them, knowing that you have worked all things out, Lord. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
with a singing for the sinner. Enough for this whole wide world. Your great grace. All such.
wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Amen. Whew! What a morning. Yeah, I... <laughs> Oh yeah. No, I wasn't planning on preaching in the in the in the wet trunks. I, why not? Yeah. <laughs> There's some droplets of water on the stage. Dry them out. All right. Hey, we are in part 35 of our series through Acts. We've been going through Acts chapter by chapter and verse by verse since January. We're going to continue that this morning by going through chapter 23, starting with verse 12, and going through the end of the chapter. But before we actually jump into God's Word, let's talk a little bit about how we partner with God where He is at work in the world. Our God is at work in the world, yeah? Okay, we're, we're good. We're on the same page there. And He wants us to join in with Him in that work, right? Right? Okay, good. So we're on the same page. So then the question is, why don't we? Why, why don't we? Every single day, how many opportunities to partner with God in the ways that he's at work in the world, how many of those opportunities do we let just pass us by? Why aren't we partnering with God in those things? Uh, chances are there's, there's many reasons, but I'm going to focus in on one reason uh, this morning, and that's that, well, first off, let's, let's think through, do, do we not recognize maybe uh, where God is at work in the world? Maybe it's, it's that his work is, is mysterious and, and, and behind the scenes so much that, that we can't even see it and recognize it when it's passing us by. And to that thought, I would really, I, I come to Ephesians 2, uh, specifically verse 10, where Paul tells us we are God's workmanship. We are his poema. We are his creation. We have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, but not just any good works, specifically good works that God, that Jesus has prepared in advance for us to do. We have been created in a particular way, and not only that, but God has prepared specific good things for us specifically to do. They were prepared in advance for us to do. So I have a difficult time believing that when we come across those good works in our daily lives that are specifically designed for us, God would go, nope, that's hidden. You're not allowed to see that. You, you can't know it. That we wouldn't be able to recognize, oh, hey, this is a way that I can do good. This is something that God is wanting me to partner with him in this regard. So I, I don't think it's that we cannot recognize the way that he's at work. And I'm wondering if, if there might be a little bit in there where, where we kind of go, you know what? I'm not going to do it right. Well, I mean, God is God, right? He is powerful. He is strong. And he is able to do anything and everything. So what might creep into our minds in this concept of partnering with him in the work that he's doing is, you know, maybe I should just kind of back up and let him do it because he's better at it than I am. He's stronger than I am. He can do much more, and, and I might even get in the way. This, this kind of thinking can even take a, a, a negative turn where uh, we're, we're almost celebrating the fact that we are not doing something. Or we can shout out to the world, look at me. Look how amazing I am. I trust God so much that I did nothing. I mean, chances are we're not going to go as far as that. That's a caricature, a hyperbole, an exaggeration. But we've seen it, and possibly we've, we've done it ourselves. I'm just going to step back and allow God to do it because he can do much more than I can. God is all-powerful, right? Right? Do we provide anything for God that he cannot provide for himself? No. <laughs> Can he work even if we're not working with him? Yeah. Can he even work even if we are actively opposing his work, if we're doing the complete opposite and trying to, to prevent him from doing the good work he wants to do? Yeah, he's God. He can do all that. But the crazy thing is, 
God doesn't want to operate without us. He has decided for himself, you know what? I want them to join in. I don't want to just do this by myself. I don't want them to be working against me. I want them to be working alongside me and working in this thing. God doesn't want us to just stand back and go, look, I am so faithful. I am letting you take care of it all. I'm going to let go and let God. It's taking that let go and let God to an extreme where we aren't even stepping in, where we can see God wants this good thing done. Let's do it. God doesn't need us. God can work in spite of us. And yet, he doesn't want to work all by himself. He wants us to join him in that work. So let's do that. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil the, the ending, the you know, action step. What are we going to do with the sermon? It's going to be to do good. Yeah, <laughs> amen. We're going to arrive there by, by looking at the passage, but I'm just going to spoil it right there. That when, when we see good that is to be done and we can meet that need, do it. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray, and then we'll jump into God's Word together. Father God in heaven, you are holy and perfect and righteous, and you do not need a single thing from us, and yet you have uh, designed us with a purpose. You have created us for your good works, your good purposes. Lord, you, you, make, you cause everything to work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. God, you are at work in this world around us. You are moving even today, even here, even now. Lord, help us to have eyes to see, and not just see the ways you're at work, but to recognize them as you working. Help us to understand and be compelled and drawn and convicted and called to those good things that you have designed for us. Lord, get rid of, of whatever uh, 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 shame or, or feelings of, of not being ready, of, of not being equipped, of, of not being good enough, and help us to simply jump in to the good things that you have for us. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And we pray this all because of you. Amen. Acts chapter 23, starting at verse 12, it says, The next morning the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders, and they said, We've taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin, petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. So let's pause there and then talk a little bit about the context uh, where we are in this story. Uh, remember... As Paul was headed to Jerusalem, in every single city that he visited, the Holy Spirit was warning him, hey, prison and hardships are going to be there waiting for you in Jerusalem. And we saw once he got in there, I mean, he was received warmly by the, 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 the elders of the church in Jerusalem, but then very quickly things turned against him and, and he was uh, arrested because there was a mob formed against him. They wanted to kill him, uh, and so he was arrested. And, and the only way he could escape the mob was by being arrested and, and put in jail. And then the Roman commander who had arrested him wanted to torture him to get information out of him, so he had to play his Roman citizen card, right, uh, and, and get out of that torture and everything. And, and now what's going on is... Well, actually, no, 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 sorry, because last week we read the passage where he was brought before the Sanhedrin, that council of Jewish leadership in Jerusalem, uh, and, and they got into an argument, and they were arguing so strongly with just amongst uh, one another that the commander was afraid they were going to kill Paul in the rabble, and so he pulled Paul out of there, and it's like, oh, geez, what's going on here? And we saw at the end of that passage that we read last week, Jesus appeared to Paul and encouraged him, so don't worry as you've testified, testified about me in Jerusalem, so you're going to testify about me in Rome. And promises, he will make it safely to Rome. Or at least he will make it alive to Rome, however you want to <laughs> read into what Jesus says there. And so now we see the result of that meeting of the Sanhedrin, because that was the Jewish leadership 
but Jerusalem is filled with, you know, the, the population is mostly Jews at this point in time, and that general population of Jews, they're still upset with Paul, especially those Jews who were there at the temple on the day Paul was arrested. Because remember, the, those who were there truly believed that Paul had defiled the temple by bringing a Gentile into the section of the temple that Gentiles were not allowed to be in that he had brought defilement uh, and, and he had just flagrantly disobeyed and disregarded God's law, God's holy law and how God wanted things to operate. And so their plan is, you know what, this leadership, they're not getting anything done. We're going to take it on ourselves. We're going we're to take an oath that we are going to kill Paul and we won't eat or drink anything until we do that. Basically, it's either we kill Paul or we die from starvation and dehydration. Uh, it's, it's him or us kind of a thing, which I don't think they actually would have gone through with. I think if enough time passes, uh, they're probably going to eat something and drink something. They're going to be like, man, oh, oh, I, I guess, okay. I think they're just being a little overly dramatic, but it, it puts the point across because they go to the, the Jewish leadership and they say, look, we have taken this oath and we're going to do this. Now, probably they weren't talking to the members of the Sanhedrin who were arguing that maybe Paul was write about some of these things. They probably went to the Sadducee leadership within them, but they tell that leadership, hey, we got a plan. You go to the commander, the Roman commander who's holding Paul, tell him you want to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin again, and, and say, you know, you want better information. You, you thought of some new questions to ask. I don't know. You make, you make something up. Just get Paul to come before you, and then while he's in transit on the way to you, we're going to spring out and ambush them and kill him. And that way, you guys won't be blamed. He didn't even make it to the Sanhedrin. Uh, you're, you're not connected with it at all, and we're finally rid of this guy. Do you see the irony of that? I'm saying we are so concerned with, with the sanctity of the temple and, and how God uh, has, has uh, said that this is a holy place, that we are going to kill someone. We're going to show how much we care about what, how God wants us to live our lives by murdering someone. Like, what is the logic there? They're seriously saying this. And, and, and so they've decided this is just how it's going to be done. And so that's a really good plan uh, to, to get Paul in transit where he'll be vulnerable and they can spring out. They've got more than 40 guys who can spring out and attack. Probably Paul's only going to have a few soldiers guarding him. They can easily overpower. That's a really good secret plan. Just, you know, the only problem is if that secret plan gets out. But that's not going to happen. There's no way this secret plan is going to be found out by anyone. <laughs> Verse 16. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and he said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. And the centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took this young man by the hand, drew him aside, and he asked, what is it you want to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. And so the commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Paul's nephew was there. I mean, you'd think when you're hatching a secret plan, you check and see, are any of this guy's family members around and going to hear about it? Like, seriously, what happened there? I don't know how that was <laughs> overlooked or anything. Uh, but the question of how was Paul's nephew even there, because remember, Paul is from Tarsus in Cilicia, this way north of Israel. Um, the, the answers, there's, there's a couple possibilities. We know that Paul's family was pretty well off. Uh, they were well off enough to be Roman citizens, at the very least. Um, and so they had sent Paul off to do his schooling in Jerusalem to learn under Gamaliel, uh, the, the well-respected Pharisee teacher there. Uh, and so that's how you know, Paul was raised. It's possible that his sister was also sent to Jerusalem, and maybe she met a nice Jewish boy there, and they got married and settled down, and, and that's why you know she has her son, and, and he's in Jerusalem. Or possibly... 
She's still up in Tarsus. She finds a, a nice Jewish boy there and gets married. And then similarly, they have enough money to send her son down to Jerusalem to learn just like Paul did. Possibly even he's being taught by Gamaliel too. Who knows? But either way, however he got there, uh, Paul's nephew is there and he hears this plan. He goes, you know what? I'm going to go tell Uncle Paul. <laughs> and it's crazy because he goes and he visits Paul and Paul is in jail and yet he has all this freedom. He can get visitors whenever he wants. The visitor comes and tells him something. He goes, hey, guard, come, come over here. Like he's ordering the guards around <laughs> and telling him, take this young man over to the commander. The commander, I don't even have access to him. Yeah, but take this, take this boy. He's going to tell him something and it's going to be juicy. He's going to love it. Paul just has this charisma and, and ability to, even while he is imprisoned, uh, to, to kind of be in control of, of parts of the situation. So uh, his nephew goes to the commander, tells him the plan, and the commander goes, okay, now I got to think about this. All right, you, you go, don't tell anyone you told me, and we're going to figure this out. So verse 23 says, then he called two of, the, of his centurions and he ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. And he wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found the, that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So this plan and this letter reveal uh, a, a few things. Um, first of all, <laughs> it's so funny. You got, you got more than 40 guys who have taken this oath. Okay, so how do you overcome 40 guys? Uh, with 470 guys, like this is dramatic overkill. We're going to send 200 foot soldiers, 200 cavalry, uh, or no, sorry, 200 uh, spearmen, 200 cavalry, and, and 70 foot soldiers. Uh, and, and, and they're going to accompany Paul out of the city to Caesarea, that, to Governor Felix. That is crazy. That's such an overkill move to protect Paul. So, so it shows first off that the commander, uh, who we finally learn his name, Claudius Lysias, uh, the commander is very concerned about Paul's well-being. As we have seen, that continues to be the case. Number two, can you imagine Felix seeing all these men transporting Paul to the city? He's going to be going, what's going on there? Who, who, are, who are they? Who's in this? What, what's, who's the important guy here that's requiring all these people? He's, uh, Claudius, is the, the commander, is presenting Paul in a very good light. Say, this is an important person. Take care of him. And third, we can see in his letter that he presents himself in a very good light, doesn't he? I was so concerned with his well-being because I learned he's a Roman citizen. Completely leaving out the, I wanted to torture him until I found out he was a Roman citizen, making it sound like he rescued him because of his citizenship, when really he arrested him and everything before he even learned all that stuff. His, his motives are completely suspect, but, but he's going, you know, I'm going to present myself in this good light. And by doing so, he really presents Paul in a good light. And so we see that, that his bad or, or maybe... Uh, dishonest intentions of, of presenting himself in the best light is actually really good for Paul in this. And so uh, they decide they're going to send him out to Caesarea, and this is what happens, verse 31. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go on with, them, with him uh, while they returned to the barracks. And when the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. And then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. So Caesarea is about 70 miles northwest of uh, Jerusalem. Um, so on a horse especially, 
two days to get there, pretty easy. The, the foot soldiers would have a diff difficult time. Um, but they only traveled the first day to Antipatris. Uh, we don't know where that city is. Uh, it's, it's gone, and, and we're not sure where exactly. Uh, a lot of people guess it was probably about midway, 35 miles away, in the Jerusalem foothills, um, so probably on the outskirts. And probably because once you get to the very far outskirts of Jerusalem, the threat against Paul is much less, and so those foot soldiers can go back to the barracks while the cavalry uh, continue to transport Paul. Still very impressive, just because some men uh, were not there. It wasn't the full 470 transporting Paul. Still very impressive to have that entourage uh, arriving in Caesarea. And when he gets there, they present the letter to Felix. Felix reads the letter and, and sees what's going on. And then Felix's reaction is pretty funny because it's kind of like this, uh, do I have to be the one to deal with this, really? Uh, that's why he's asking, what province are you from? He's trying to see, are you from an area of the Roman Empire that's my jurisdiction, or can I just send you back home and have whoever's in charge of that deal with all this stuff? But he finds out of Cilicia, oh, yeah, that's part of my jurisdiction. Okay. Fine, I'll hear your case once your accusers get here. Um, you seem to be an important guy. I'll set you up in Herod's palace. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Here's, this is uh, the palace built by Herod, uh, and this is where dignitaries would stay when they were visiting the city. All the other times, it would be empty. And so he's like, okay, yeah, Paul, you can, you can hang out in this palace. I mean, pretty fun, pretty ritzy and, and, and fancy and all this stuff. And it's like, wow. Can you see God's hand at work in this story? Like we saw God working, orchestrating things throughout this story, right? God working, uh, bringing that Roman commander in and, and giving him this curiosity about Paul and this, this care for taking care of Paul. Uh, God uh, making it so that Paul's nephew is in the right place at the right time to hear that plot and be able to bring it to the commander and tell him. God even working in the, the you know, kind of deceptive motivations of Claudius as he wrote this letter to Felix and, and, and presenting himself in the best light, but also presenting Paul in a really good light so that Paul can end up in Herod's palace while he's arrested and waiting to have his case heard by Felix. God was working through all of that. But I think the, most, the, the, the pivotal moment to me in my eyes as, as I read through this passage is that moment when Paul's nephew visits Paul in prison and shares that plot. Because at that point, once Paul hears this plot against him, Paul has a choice. He can either do what he did, send his nephew to go see uh, the commander and, and tell him the plot and, and get the ball rolling on things, or Paul can sit back, tell his nephew, don't worry, trust God. God has promised he's going to get me to Rome. Just trust him. He'll He'll take care of everything. I am trusting God. Here we go. And now if he had, we have to admit, if he had done that, that probably would have been a pretty cool story because I don't think God would have, you know, reneged on his agreement that, uh, that he would have said, nope, now you don't get to go to Rome. Uh, I think God would have come through in that. And yet we see when Paul's nephew arrives with that news, Paul recognizes that, yes, this is his nephew, but Beyond that, this is God at work. This is God's working. So what do I do when I see God working and providing something? Do I sit back and go, wow, that's really cool, God. Now uh, you keep doing your thing and I'll, I'll just stay out of your way. Or do we instead join in with that work? Say, look, oh, hey, this plot is being exposed. Let's expose this to the right person. All right, go over to the commander, let him know, and we'll blow this thing wide open, and we'll get the ball rolling on this. I think we can see the parallels in our lives when we see God at work in the world around us. We are not meant to simply go, wow, that's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll keep my distance, and God, you just keep doing your thing. God wants us to step in and join him in that work. And I'm not even talking about, you know, uh, mysterious, hidden, we need to take time and discern God's will and, and what he actually wants here. I'm talking about basic, easy to recognize things. What is good? God wants that. What is true? God wants that. What is just? God wants that. And we can recognize those things. 
as we are walking around in the world around us, as we see evil and injustice and lies and deception, we can recognize those for what they are and go, actually, you know what? God doesn't want those things. He wants goodness and he wants love and he wants mercy and he wants truth and he wants justice and he wants us to be at work in those things. If you see something, a, a need that can be met, a good thing that can be done and you recognize it for what it is and you have the means to do it, do it. It is, we don't have to make it complicated. We don't have to hem and haw and, oh, I don't know, it's gonna, I'm going to go out of my way and, and it's going to throw everything off and maybe, I'm, maybe this is something else and I'm going to take the blessing away from someone. I don't know what the excuses are, but it's not complicated. God wants us. God is, is doing the work. And he's saying, come on, come on. I don't, I don't know. No, come on, come on. I'm not ready for it. No, you are. That's, that's okay. Because <laughs> it's not us doing the heavy lifting. God's doing the heavy lifting. But that doesn't mean that we sit back and let him do all of the work and, and, and just do it all. Yeah, when we're in there and working, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a, a dad with um, the, the, the yard work tools and everything and, and the little kid, they're not actually pushing the lawnmower, but, but they get to be a part of it. And God wants that. He's a good father who wants to train us in the ways to do good things, to grow up and mature into fully formed, grown adults so that we reflect the image of Christ in this world so that we understand the will of God, the good and perfect, pleasing will of God, and we cannot conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, and we are doing what God wants us to do, what God designed us to do, and the good things that he has prepared in advance for us. We don't need to complicate it. We just need to do it. Can we do that? Amen. Let's pray and then we'll worship God through song one more time. Jesus, we love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we do not always display that with our actions. Many times we allow opportunities to partner with you in your work in the world just pass us by. Lord, help us to overcome uh, as, as, as uh, the sinner came and told you, Jesus, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. We believe, Jesus, that you have the power, that you are at work in the world, that you want us to come along with you. Help us to overcome our unbelief and the excuses we put in front of that. Help us to reflect you out into this world to recognize the way you're at work and to meet you there, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we praise you, and we pray all of this because of you. Amen.
Messiah.